Welcome to worship on Wednesday during this uh, Holy Week, the week of the Passion. And uh, we're just glad that you're with us this evening. And uh, during this uh, Holy Week, one of uh, the scriptures in the Bible, uh, Isaiah 53, talks in particular about the Passion of our Christ. And so I want to begin the service this evening with singing Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions by his stripes we have gone astray we've turned everyone to his own way and God laid all our iniquity on him like a lamb they led him out yet not his mouth and his precious blood poured out an offering for sin he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquity. All our punishment was upon him, and by his stripes we clothed in lowly humanity and though we saw him we could not see the glory of his grace but every law was satisfied the moment he laid down his life the power of death was destroyed the debt was paid he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised
today. Thank you, Brother Alex and Jane, for blessing our hearts and music. What a beautiful song that is. We know that by his stripes we are healed. If you have your Bible at home, turn to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to pick up the first commandment tonight. And uh, verse 3 is the first commandment. If you remember, we talked about that uh, the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. And so I want you to be reminded of that because um, it's important to know that the first most important thing is, is our relationship with God. I remember as a child, back in the old days, as my grandchildren will say in, to me in Buffalo, back in the dinosaur days of the 50s, uh, I remember learning the Ten Commandments, and it was one of those things that you learned, and you got a star put by your name uh, because you learned it, memorized them, and, uh, you know, memorizing them is, that's not too bad. It's living them is tough because they really deal with obedience and the things that uh, we need to learn from God and what God wants us to learn about him and the truth of living as God would have us to live. Well, let's read verse 3, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to this evening, we thank you for this time to open up your word again. And as we open up your word, I pray that our hearts would be clean, that we would ask you to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I pray, Lord, thanking you for taking that beating to die on that cross, that by your stripes we can be healed. And Father, I pray tonight that you would just open up your word to us and that we would apply it to our lives. And Lord, just let it be a time that we could draw closer to you and really learn more about what you would expect out of us in our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The first commandment that Jesus, that the Lord gives here, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why is that important? Well, we know God's a jealous God, and we know that he says, I am, meaning the only God, that there is no other God but him. He has no rival that compares to him. But you need to realize and understand that when the people lived in Egypt, the Egyptians worshipped all kinds of gods. They worshipped the sun, they worshipped darkness, they worshipped the fields, they worshipped the rivers, uh, they just worshipped everything that could possibly be. Well, for 400 years, the people of Israel had lived in Egypt, in this environment, in this society, where people worshipped all kinds of gods and all kinds of elements uh, to fall down before and, and to worship. And so what happened with the people of Israel is that they began to follow that. You know, if you live somewhere 400 years, one generation stays strong, next generation gets a little weak, the next generation gets a little bit weaker, and the next generation gets a little bit weaker, and the next generation gets even a little bit more weaker. It's kind of like in our own society. When I was a child growing up, we had what we call the blue law. Remember the blue law? Yeah. Yeah. Only thing could open on Sunday was drugstore, and it was for one hour. One hour, 12 to 1 o'clock, a drugstore would open. Well, all of a sudden, things change. And all of, a, all of a sudden, the little convenience stores started staying open. And then this started staying open, and this started staying open. And now in this day, what, 70 years later, everything's open on Sunday just about. I don't know. Very many things that are closed on Sunday, just a few stores. But that's how society influences you. And so that's what was happening to the people of Israel. They were being influenced by this godless society that was worshiping all of these false gods. And they, the people were just following after them. And so God is bringing them back and he's telling them about taking a stand against those false gods that these nations uh, 
had come in and the people of God had begun to serve and, and to follow. God did not want to give false gods one ounce of legalness. You know, legitimacy. He didn't want them to have that. And he doesn't want it today. Okay? God wants us to understand there's only one God. There are no other gods. He is the only God there is. And you and I need to come back and understand that he was talking to them and Israel was bound to God through the covenant with Abraham. And so they, they were God's people and he was going to be their God. It's kind of like us today. We are bound to God through the covenant with Jesus Christ who gave his life for us at Calvary. And that you and I know that, that we have to have no other gods before us. He is sovereign and he has the right to rule over us and to expect us to worship him and to have no other gods before him. In 1 Samuel chapter uh, 12 and verse 21 and 1 Corinthians verse 8, uh, verses 4 and 5. If you take your Bible and you want to read there in 1 Corinthians with me for just a moment, he talks about this very issue in 1 Corinthians 8, 4 and 5. And he says, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered and sacrificed into idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one, only one God. For though there be that that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords. You know, he wants us to know there's only one God and that you and I realize he is sovereign, he's in control, and there is no other God besides him. Now look, at, he says, you'll have no other gods before me. And, and in Hebrew, that word before means in opposition to me. God's saying, there will be no other gods in opposition before me. There will be no other gods in opposition to me. Or there will be no other gods before my face. He is the only true and living God. And that you and I begin to realize the presence and, and to know that uh, you cannot worship false gods. You know, you say, well, it's over here, over there. Listen, God's everywhere. Wherever we go, God is. So you can't go somewhere else and say, I'm going to worship a false God over here. God will be there. He's God. So God is sovereign and in control of all things that are there. And let me ask you a question. The gods of this world, and when you think about a God, you're really talking about something that draws your heart away from God. What, what has the power of God? What gods have the power or the ability to deliver us from our situations in life? There is no other God. He is the only true God, and no one, no other God can stand before him. Now, I know a lot of people uh, have gods, the, the things that draw their hearts away from God. But you know what? I've never seen a golf club deliver God, somebody out of their situation. I've never seen a boat deliver somebody. I've never seen possessions. I've never seen those things that people hold on to and want to fall down and be the center of their life, really begin to deliver them and to help them, to realize there's only one true God. And, you know, he, he tells us this, and, and there's no other gods that should be there before us. And God has given us this command because people are and can and are going to find things that will draw them and gain their, their attention and their power. And so God is reminding the people of, of Israel, listen, you may have been in Egypt, and there may have been all these false gods they were worshiping, but you need to know I am. And there's no other God that can stand before me. There's no other God that can oppose me. There's no other God who can do the things that I can do. And that we really need to see this. I want to ask you to take your Bible and turn over to uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. You know, there in, in 1 Kings 18, 21, the prophet Elijah is up on the mount. And he's having the contest with the 
false prophets of Baal. And, and it's interesting to me that when you look at this, then the, in verse 21, Elijah said unto the people, and to all the people, and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered not a word. Isn't that interesting? Here's the man of God standing up before the people and saying, If God's God, worship him. And if Baal is God, worship him. And I want you to notice what happened. The people did not respond. They didn't give an answer. <coughs> Never gave an answer. Why? Because they had to make a choice. They had to make a choice. They had to say, yes, I'll worship the true and living God, or yes, I'll have to worship Baal, the false God. And it's kind of like that today, isn't it? Choose who you're going to worship. Who are you going to worship? <coughs> the true God or Baal? And when people are confronted with that, they tend just to keep silent. They don't want to have to answer it. They don't want to have to say. They would rather not be brought to that point to make a choice. And here we find that the prophet is telling the people, you've got to choose today. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to fall down before? You see, with God, it's all or nothing. When it comes to having, he doesn't want us to have anything else in front of him. That's family, friends, material things, whatever it is. He does not want anything in front of him. He wants everything from us. He won't take leftovers. That's not pleasing to God. God wants everything from us so that you and I begin to realize and understand that we're, we're there to be all in, to give him everything, and to realize that we don't want any other false gods. We don't need any other uh, gods to be there. He talks about in, this, in the Hebrew, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's in the, in the grammar. It's about you as an individual. You as an individual choose today not to have any other gods before me. You. You. Not only as a corporate body, but individually we have to make that decision of what we are going to do and what's most precious to us in our lives. Is God most precious to us? I believe we'd all be better off if we took time to really look to see what's most precious to us in our lives. What are you willing to make the greatest sacrifice for today? Is it God? Or is it something else? What is it that you're willing to make the greatest sacrifice for? You're willing to put everything that you have into that. What is it? I think sometimes that we make the wrong decisions and we do the things that we shouldn't because we've chosen the wrong gods to worship, to follow after. You know, even in, in the times that we walk in today, we need to realize that these false gods will enslave us because they become so much to us and they, they consume us and they, they just take us away from God the true and living God. They draw us away from him and, and from his words and draw our heart away from the true and living God. And that's what Satan wants to do. Understand that in this commandment, God wants us to be so focused on him that we're not looking for any other gods. He is the only God and we're, we're looking at him. Nothing else. And we don't let anything entice us or lead us away from God. What a challenge that is in the world we live in today. I think 
and believe with all my heart with all the things that we have in this world today. It is so easy to see ourselves being drawn away from God, being drawn away from the things that God would have us to do and be. We just find ourselves falling. We forget about God. We let those things take our time away from God. He's not as precious to us. So when you think about this first commandment, realize that God is saying to the people of Israel, just like he would say to us today, listen, don't go after those false gods. Don't go after those gods that can't help you, that can't sustain you, and can't guide you in your life. Follow me. Keep me first. Keep me first in your life. Don't have anything that will draw you away from me. Don't let something draw you away from God. It's easy in this day, isn't it? I mean, so much is going on. So many things are happening. It is so easy to be drawn away from your family. It, it's so easy to be drawn away from uh, all the things of the world by things that we put a priority on. What about coming back and, and worshiping him? Let me, let me share with you a little bit. There was a, a man in the Bible by the name of Solomon. Solomon started off. He went to God and he said, God, or God asked him, said, Solomon, what, what do you want? Well, Solomon asked God that he could have wisdom. And Solomon started off on good footing. He really did. But you see, something happened to Solomon. Solomon began to have many wives and concubines. And they all brought their false gods with them. And you know what Solomon did? He built places of worship for those false gods. And it drew him away from God. God told him the kingdom would be taken from him. And it was. His son, the kingdom went to ten tribes. And his son got to two southern tribes. All because he began to chase other gods. When you chase other gods... It affects your relationship with God. Because you're putting something in the face of God that's opposite to God. And so it begins to draw you away from God. Maybe you don't mean for it to draw you away from God. Maybe you never intended for it to be used to, to divide your heart. But it does. It begins to divide your heart. And when it begins to divide you, it begins to pull you away from where God wants you to be. God doesn't want us to have any other gods. He only wants us to have one God. That's him. No other gods. You know, even Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For either he'll hate one and love the other. Well, that's what happens. When you have another God, whatever it is, it draws you away from God. One God you're going to hate. And one God you're going to love. Which one is it? Which one is it in your life? What a challenge in our society for you and me to be sure that we don't let anything else take our focus off of God. That we keep him first and foremost in our hearts, in our minds, in everything that we do. You know, Paul understood this. I mean, he understood it so much. He said, you know, for me to live is Christ. And in other words, man, my whole focus is on Jesus. My focus isn't on what I'm doing. It's on Jesus. He understood that. When you read and understand that, that it doesn't matter, all those other things, they can't answer your prayers, they can't help you, they can't strengthen you, None of it goes with you. 
Only God makes a difference in our life. Only God makes a difference in our hearts. And so we need to come back and realize when he was talking, he said, I don't want these other gods in front of me. I don't want them in opposition to me. I want your heart. I want your focus. I want everything that you are to be on me. Nothing else on me. You would have thought after the people had gone through the plagues and seen the power of God, you would have thought that man, they would have no problems getting rid of their false gods. You would think they'd, they'd say, man, I'm going to throw that away. And then after the last plague, the death of the firstborn throughout the land of Egypt, you would have thought, man, let's put away these false gods. You would have thought that when they got to the Red Sea and, and the Egyptian army was coming up behind them and God parted the waters and they went through the, the water and then when they got to the other side, the fact is when they went through that water, think about it, it was dry ground. That's amazing right there. I mean, that's how a mighty God is. And so they, they walked through on dry ground. And they got to the other side, and all the water came back and destroyed the Egyptian army. You would have thought that would have been enough. But it wasn't. It wasn't. Because their hearts were not where they need to be. Because if you go on in the story, after seeing all that God had done, when Moses was gone on the mount, what happened? What happened? They built a golden calf. Isn't it interesting? They built a golden calf like they'd seen in Egypt to worship him. God was telling them, don't have any other gods before me. And God says the same thing to you and me today. Don't have any gods before me. No other God. Don't put anything in opposition. You and I have seen the power of God. We've seen prayers answered. I mean, if I ask you, and you could give testimony if you were here tonight, you could give testimony to the power of God, how God answered prayer, how God's done great things in your life. You can tell the same thing. Well, why do we chase after things that draw our hearts away from God? Let's go after God. Let's get focused on God. Nothing else in our lives but focused on the true and living God every day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together to worship you. Lord, to open your word and be reminded that we don't need any other gods. You're all we need. You are the great I am. You're sovereign. You're in control. And I pray, God, that you would help us to never, ever put something in opposition to you. Father, I ask your blessings upon your people to guide and direct each one and help each one in their needs today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We look forward to Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, as we will gather. Uh, we won't gather here, but we'll be gathering to have a worship service, and you will tune in and enjoy that time together. God bless you. Have a great week.